Hey, welcome back. So what we did so far was to work with the data, right? We imported our data, we looked if there were any problems with it, we transformed it in such a way that we will be able to use it for our problem. And uh, at this point, normally what we do next is feature engineering. So try to create some new features. But before we do that, I think it's always a good idea to come up with a benchmark model. So you might be thinking, what is a benchmark model? Uh, as you might understand from the name, it's basically a benchmark that we will try to pass when we are doing our actual training. So at this point, I will not think about some new features that I can create, but all I will do is to, you know, have the uh, features that I already have, which is at this point, pickup location ID, transaction month, transaction day, and transaction hour, also trip distance. Uh, and I will try to see, okay, only using these features, how can I, like, what is the performance? What is the level that I can achieve already? So basically then you can compare it later and then you can say, oh, okay, after doing the feature engineering, my p model performs better than the benchmark. So, you know, obviously these new features are a plus or maybe it will not really improve too much. And then you can say, well, okay, that was a waste of time, <laughs> but at least we will have something to uh, compare it to. So this will kind of be our baseline. So. Uh, I'll show you how I did it until now. Uh, basically what I did again is to create a whole new data frame, you know, again, just in case I change things, uh, I don't want the original data frame to be affected because also that's the taxi group, uh, taxi grouped by region is the one that uh, I will go forward with and I will put the features on top of. So um, a couple of things that we have to think about here. So first, when we're starting to train a model, uh, there are a couple of things that we need to do. So we have our data and the first thing that we need to do is to decide which ones are the input features. So basically, if you think of your model as a black box, the things that will be inputted, the features and then the target feature. So that's the thing that we are trying to predict. So in our case, this is how I did it. I want to, I always write the categorical features separately, you know, just in case I want to have them noted somewhere. Uh, it's pick, uh, pick up location ID, transaction month, transaction day and transaction hour. So um, you might think that, okay, but month, day and hour is actually, uh, they're numerical. Why are we writing them, including them in the categorical one? Because, you know, our month, we only have one. So that's also not going to be very useful just for the specific data set. But once we want to uh, include other months, it will be more important. Um, but day and hour are actually the most important uh, time-wise features here. But the reason that I have them in the categorical is because they have a, a circular relationship. So, you know, hour zero comes right after hour 12. And, but that's really hard for a model to know if you don't get that information in. So there are a couple of ways how you can include circular features. So basically what you do is you divide them into two features, kind of like X and Y. So you, uh, you know, uh, zero becomes like zero, zero. And then, then you create kind of like a circular relationship between them. Uh, but I didn't want to do it just here. So I just wanted the model to think that, you know, every hour is a different entity. And I don't want to think of like a relationship between the hours. Same with days, you know, after the 30th or the 31st day, normally what happens is day first comes of the next month, but it will be more work to include it in the model. So just for now, I didn't want to include it and I wanted to keep them as categorical features. Then we come to our input features where I also uh, noted down my numerical feature. So it's everything, all the ones that are here and the trip distance. Well, trip distance is number of miles so you know there is a linear relationship there so i kept it that way and the uh, most important one is total amount that's what we're going to try to predict so that's the target feature so that's a very common notation you always uh, hear people say it or refer to the thing that you're trying to predict as a target feature so that's important uh, and then yeah okay we can run this this is just me saying you know these are these ones these are the input ones these are the target ones and then you see X and Y here. So it's very common to write input or target specifically, but for some reason I learned it this way and I always keep doing it this way. For me, inputs are X's and output or the target is Y. So I always keep it that way. So the next thing that we need to think about after we separate the input and the target features is to separate or split our data set into train and test data sets. Um, there is 
kind of like an approach how you can take this. There is no strict rules about how much data you should set aside for test, how much data you should set aside for train, but it's always common to do it kind of like an 80%, 20% or in that kind of region. Uh, basically, you want to have enough data to train your model, but at the same time, you also want to leave enough data points for the test set so that when you want to test it, you will be able to validate your data so it's not the test uh, data points are not too few. In this specific data set, I have a lot of data points, so it's not really a big concern of mine to you know have enough training data points or test data points. So I basically go for kind of like the highest borderline amount that I can get. So what it means here is basically one third of the data set will be the test uh, data set and the two thirds will be the training. So one thing that might get your attention here is this get dummies function. And I have this here because I want to one hot encode my data set. Um, I want to do this because my model cannot deal with strings. My model cannot deal with categorical uh, variables or features. So that's why I'm turning my categorical features into numerical ones with which the model can work for, with, with, with which, <laughs> with which the model can work. And then I will run this. Now we have our data set split in four. X train is our input features for the training. Uh, and X test is our input features for the testing. And Y's are the target features for train and test respectively. Um, yeah, so that's how we split our data. And the next thing that we want to do is basically train our model. So I know Machine learning is this huge thing that everyone is talking about, but literally when you're doing data science, this is the amount of machine learning that you do, which is, you know, the, these two lines. Basically, you're saying decision tree regressor and decision tree fit, and you give the data, and yeah, it does it for you. Uh, a couple of things that I want to talk about here is normally if you don't put anything here, so we said max depth 10. If you don't put anything here, it will run the default model. But we're doing max depth then because, well, let me first tell you what this is. So max depth is a hyperparameter. So every model has kind of like, think of it as like knobs and settings. You know, you can change how deep you let a decision tree to go or, you know, how shallow you want it to be. How do you want the branches to separate? What do you want the condition to be there, etc. And then you can write all of them here. But for now, it's basically the kind of the goal of machine learning at the end of the day is not to use the default version, obviously, but trying to find the optimal hyperparameter values for your uh, specific problem. And it's going to be very different for every problem. Uh, there are some rule of thumbs, but in general, it's kind of like a trial and error thing. And uh, you, you're trying to kind of optimize a whole different problem there. And that's tuning. And we're going to talk about this all the way at the end after I fit the actual models with all my features in it. We'll talk about tuning and how we approach it later. Uh, but for now, we're using max step 10. I will explain also why later, but this is kind of like a go-to thing that I use also. It's just, uh, th th these numbers are very hard to understand. Um, so, you know, it's sometimes confusing. You're like, okay, but what is the difference between having 110 or 10,000? But yeah, we'll talk about this in more detail soon. So for now, I want to have a max depth of 10 and yeah, the model is already trained. So the next thing we're going to do is to evaluate the model and see how we performed.